when I first met Kennedy back in the late 1940s, she was actually a Republican. <laughs> That's, true. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, had a little pink elephant tattooed in an inaccessible spot. Still got it. How did you come out of the darkness into the bright light of libertarianism? Um, by your graceful hand, because you gave me uh, Ayn Rand's objectivist epistemology over dinner, and you were like, you have to read this. And I didn't understand this libertarianism that you spoke of, because you were so smart, and you would bash all these liberals, and I would, I would nod and acquiesce and say, yes, yes, that's it, I agree. But then you would also badmouth Republicans for being social hypocrites. <laughs> And uh, you would sort of mutter under your breath, you're not a Republican, you're a Libertarian. It's like, what, what does that even mean? I didn't understand. And uh, luckily, under your mentorship, I, I came to see the light. And it took some years. Well, I'm glad you arrived. I've moved on from Ayn Rand, by the way, just so you know. Um, She's very sad to hear that, but Ayn Rand didn't like Libertarians. No, she hated Libertarians. The, uh, you, I'm amazed how you remembered all this stuff. I can't remember last week, but you're remembering back 20 years. Did you have to really canvas people and extract their memories? I did, I, and it, it was uh, it was really amusing because as I started going through the stories, and I would call people for stories about the Beach House and the Video Music Awards and almost getting fired, you know, people would say the same thing, like, oh, I've, I've forgotten that. And then they would remember details that I either didn't know about or had long forgotten. Mm. And that was that was true with you. You read the book and <clears throat> you realize there's a story in there that's patently false. <laughs> well, that's true. But let's not say what it is. <laughs> <laughs> These things, it's actually a good story. So <laughs> who cares? What's that sleeping dog's lie? I'm trying to be professional so I have a tattered list with oh, me. Oh, well done. The, um, you, you actually got to make friends with pop stars. I never did that. But you actually, you were a hardcore journalist. I was a VJ. Was, I was wearing was men's pajamas. One. and. The, but you made, you made friends with these people, and I think we have the same estimation of Courtney Love, who's like a nightmare, right? Oh, God. Is that putting it too softly? It really is. And, you know, I wrote some harsh things about Courtney in my book because I had to be honest. Um, and, you know, I had the chance to take him out through the editing process, and I didn't because <laughs> she's nuts. That's true. She That's still true. is his day, and, and one of the most memorable scenes that I constantly relive in my mind is when you were interviewing Madonna on a platform at the Video Music Awards, live, and Courtney Love started emptying her makeup bag and throwing it at your head. It's also... Hi, Courtney. That's true, that's true. Do you know that, do you know that she and Russell Crowe actually used to write poetry together? In, in balmy nights, I asked him about that once. I said, did you really do this? Said, yeah, as if, what would be wrong with it? <laughs> So she must perhaps she has reserves that we're not seeing. She always needed a male collaborator, though. I found that very interesting. <laughs> I, I so thought true. that that was kind of a weakness because she told me that she wasn't interested in competing with the other women of the day, whether it's Liz Fair or Kim Gordon, that she wanted to compete with the boys, meaning Trent Reznor and, and Billy mm. Corgan. Or do something with them. We don't know yeah, why. by compete, I mean put their... Now, you're, you're, also, their you're also friends with Billy Corgan. Isn't he an Alex Jones prison planet guy? Does Billy, that worry you? Yeah, you know, Billy is one of those people, and libertarian means many things to many people. Doesn't mean that, though. <laughs> Billy, no way. from what he said, he considers himself to be a libertarian. But he believes a lot of these conspiracy theories that are not grounded in reality or logic. <laughs> Billy, are you here? <laughs> what a wonderful surprise. You're also pals with Dave Navarro, a man who I also have to take the task, because he collects John Wayne Gacy clown paintings. John Wayne Gacy being the famous torturer and murderer of children. I don't find that to be ironic. No, he's, I, and I, I didn't marry him. He you, was not the Dave I chose. You have to drop chose. all these people. You have to drop them all. Kurt, whatever you tell me, I'll do. <laughs> I seriously am your zombie slut robot. And uh, <laughs> If there's no Dave Navarro, we'll make it so. Uh, yeah. Do I need to fiddle with his brakes? No, but he, uh, he did, I, and that was one of the reasons I was attracted to him, because he had a dark sense of humor. So when you walked into his kitchen, he had um, one of those doctor's office urine collectors with uh, dark yellow substance, and the label said Gene Hackman. And, uh, <laughs> I was hooked. Well, okay, that's funny. That's yeah. funny. I go but I, I, I agree. If it had been Bob Ross, it would have been more acceptable. Yeah. Did you, uh, you sort of left, uh, there was a little tension when you left MTV. Did you, did you mend fences before you left or did you just? With who? With MTV, MTV in general? Yeah. 
I mean, um, you explain this in the book, but yeah, it, it wasn't tension so much as my own personal anxiety because I knew I was going to leave. I knew that my contract was up in December of 1997, mm. and I had been dating my boyfriend for two years, and I really wanted to be with him. He was never going to move to New York. And uh, I knew that I would, if I was really in love and wanted to pursue an adult life, I would have to be with him. And I had already been on MTV for five years. And it's one of those things like, how long can you be a <laughs> VJ before you overstay your welcome at the party? Mm-hmm. And uh, I wasn't really interested in finding that out. But it was a great source of anxiety. And I remember one story in particular that I get into in the book is we were flown to Texas, and Tony DeSanto might remember, uh, if you're here, Tony, and if you could fill in the details of this. We were flown to Texas <laughs> to interview Evander Holyfield at his gym. And we were held hostage in our hotel rooms for three days because <laughs> at any moment, the champ was going to call, and we were going to take the entire crew, the entire production, over to his gym and interview him probably for 20 minutes. And, uh, and he prayed on it, and he decided at the last minute that uh, it was revealed to him that MTV was immoral and horrible and polluted young minds. So after three days of sitting in a hot hotel room in Houston, Texas, he decided that he wasn't going to do the interview. And that's when I wanted to take a handful of pills. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and it was then that I was going to write Andy a letter and be like, dude, I'm so burned out. Andy Schoen was my boss at the time. And then my boyfriend, Dave, was Mm. in a motorcycle accident. He broke his back in August of 97. And he had surgery. And uh, he looked at me from his hospital bed. And he was very vulnerable. And I was very sad. And I realized, I knew I loved him, but I didn't realize how deeply I loved him. And he said, I don't want you to be my girlfriend anymore. I want to marry you. And I was like, oh, baby. I'm this is the sweetest part of the book. It's so cute. I'm sorry. But no, he really is. Like, he's, he's so awesome. I wish he was here tonight. But Kennedy's uh, greatest, one of your greatest appearances, I think, was the thing with Rudy Giuliani, some address to many New Yorkers on a, on a stage. And she's standing behind Rudy, who's rabbiting on about something, and fellating a microphone on camera. <laughs> Just brilliant. Just the greatest thing that's ever you happened. You were one of the few people who thought so. <laughs> <laughs> you and Sumner Redstone... Did not share the same opinion that night. Uh, Sumner. Mm. Um, He was a lovely man, I'm sure. But for the first time, and this was a big night. This was 1994. The Video Music Awards. And and Kurt and Tabitha and, and the entire MTV News organization were always the broadcast before the Video Music Awards, before and after, and MTV News was an important part of all of these big events. The VJs, not so much. Like, we were lucky to get... A ticket to the Video Music Awards, no plus one. But this year in 94, they asked uh, Bill Bellamy and me to present the Viewer's Choice Award, which was a huge honor. And it was also my 22nd birthday. And this was an enormous night. And I was so excited. And I had this great blue tie-dyed crush velvet <laughs> Todd Oldham suit and you know purple MAC lipstick. And, and I was feeling it. My brother had flown in. And Roseanne was the host that year, and she took the stage and insinuated that I had given Rush Limbaugh a blowjob backstage. Rush Limbaugh wasn't even there. (laughs) (laughs) So when it came time to solicit votes for the for the Viewers Choice Award, it was it was Bill Bellamy who was smiling and handsome, and Rudy Giuliani who was completely clueless and had lobbied MTV so hard to come back to New York City for the VMAs, and me standing next to the mayor. And our faces go up on the big screen at Radio City Music Hall, <laughs> and everyone starts booing. And I don't know why they're booing. I just assume, because I'd been there for two years, and I had run into a lot of hatred and polarization. I assume they were booing me. And so what do you do? you got to take the moment back from them. And the only thing that occurred to my young, still virginal mind was, I bet I can give this microphone a blowjob and get a few laughs. laughs. And and that's what I started doing. And I watched the tape one time. It was Doug Herzog's <laughs> Going Away video, which it now miraculously disappeared when Rudy Giuliani <laughs> ran for president. No one can find this tape. And uh, I got this wild look in my eye. And I, it, it looks like possession. Like, all of a sudden, I'm standing there kind of oblivious. And then I look a little worried. And then it clicks. And I, I do this kind of, like, nutty Courtney Love look. And I, ah. <laughs> The microphone was delighted. The mayor had no idea, and Sumner Redstone was furious. To that point, he had no idea who I was. All he knew was he wanted me gone from the earth. And he probably could <laughs> have made you survived. It happen. And that was because of Andy Schoen. And, and actually, Lauren Levine, who's here tonight, uh, went up to Tom Freston at an after party and made 
some joke about how funny that was and Tom just met her with like icy silence and, and I will fire you the second stare and she was like okay I'm gonna go get a cocktail good to see you guys and somehow I kept my job uh, it was fabulous it was a great reign that you had how many years were you on MTV not as many as you. Oh, you were there for what? Like nobody's been on as long as I, I know. know. And people ask me all the time, like, "Is Kurt still at MTV?" And I say, "Yes, he is." Why not? No one I know watches anymore. So <laughs> exactly. Do you always get that question too? I mean, there, there are people who always come up to you and say, "Why can't MTV be like it was back in the '90s?" And I always say, you know, nothing is like it was back in the '90s. Uh, if you want to watch videos now, you just go on YouTube. Yeah. But people seem to want to go back or something. Do you hear that a lot from people? I hear that more than anything. When I talk about my book, people wistfully do the thousand yard stare and like, oh, remember when MTV played videos? And I do, and it was great, <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun, and it was gainful employment. But music is so different now. Media is so different now. And, you know, they, they really... Although cocaine is cheaper, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Columbia, Kirk. <laughs> Because that and Starbucks, that is an East Village free base right there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my old boss, Andy Schoen, is starting a music channel. So mm. we'll see, he's starting a channel with Diddy because there are enough people, in their estimation, who want music on TV again. What could go wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be great. Hardly anything. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, do you have any questions for Kennedy? I think you do. Or Kurt. Like, you can ask no, Kurt questions, too. No, it's not about too, me. It's Kurt, about you. I know, but I, I used to love walking past her office because it was the 90s, and, you know, we were just newly leaving sexual harassment because we all had to take a sexual harassment. <laughs> How do I figure into this? Well, you have to ask. <laughs> but we all had to take these anti-sexual harassment seminars after Anita Hill, so we would stop talking about pubic hairs on our Coke cans. <laughs> and... Uh, and I would walk past Kurt's office, and it was like the last bastion of political incorrectness because Kurt would be smoking. He would have a snifter of something, probably apple juice, and, uh, and he'd be smoking in his office. And there'd be people wheezing, walking by dramatically, and Kurt's like, meh. <laughs> and remember. you would always answer my questions. I think the only thing that you showed any annoyance about, at least with me, was when we would be in the makeup room together. And um, you would be in the chair getting your makeup done, which was very, it was hard to get you to sit still for five minutes to put makeup on you, but you would eventually do it. And, uh, and I would be spraying my hair with conditioning spray, trying to defrizz it, and I would your spray you. hair was bigger then. It was so big. I would spray you in the face, and I just remember Kirk going, <laughs> and Audrey, our makeup artist, going, girl, can you please wait till Kurt leaves my chair? It's hard enough to get him in here in the first place. I remember we going to one of those meetings. It was the golden age of... Uh, of it was even, no, it wasn't more PC than today, but there was a, a meeting where they'd take everybody, bust them three hours away to have a meeting about feel, feel good mm. stuff. And I remember every, we were in a meeting where there was a facilitator tell, telling about 100 people to imagine being a tree. Mm. And you're supposed to, it was just unbelievable. So there, there was that <laughs> Did you imagine you were a tobacco a, tree? Yeah, it was, it was a strange... <laughs> It was a strange conglomeration of things. I was never allowed on the on the group excursions oh, after the Rod Stewart incident. What was that? He was uh, he was backstage at the John Stewart show. He was going to be a guest when John Stewart had a show on MTV. And Lauren Levine heard about this. You poor thing. I'm so sorry. Lauren <laughs> is my dear friend. She was my boss for a long time, and so many times she had to call and reprimand me for something. And she would say, "I have to tell myself you're 20. I always forget." <laughs> and dog ears but emotionally I'm like four um, but Rod Stewart was backstage and uh, I was feeling very impulsive and had a belly full of brownies uh -oh. I and, uh, and I was PMSing <clears throat> and so Rod Stewart was just ripe for the plucking and so I went in and I'm like hi Rod um, did they really pump a quart of semen from your stomach <laughs> and then I thought for a minute about what that would actually entail like how like who had the Pyrex quart size pitcher and you know it's like do, do they refrigerate it and wait like how many people would it take to, to make a quart like that, that's a lot more than you think I mean it's that's an entire aircraft carrier full of several bands semen yeah uh, and 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 he said I'm so sorry Julian I know it's the museum of sex and we really should keep it clean you're absolutely right 
And he said, he, he laughed it off. He said, oh, that old thing. Oh, He's Rody made before. that up. Blah, blah. You know, it's like, <laughs> ah, yeah, it's a fun rumor, isn't it? And then uh, I was like, yeah, that's fun. Thanks. And I left and ate the other half of the brownie tray. And then Rachel Hunter, to whom he was married, the leggy supermodel, Rachel's mom, or whatever that stupid song is, um, he was married to her, and as they were walking out, you know, he seemed fine, but she was like, don't you believe the rumors you hear, blah! <laughs> and then uh, the next day I was called into Lauren's boss's office, and I was certain he was about to have an aneurysm because he was yelling at me with such intensity, the veins were actually <laughs> external to his neck. He was so angry. And there had been, you know, a number of things that I had done prior to that. And they were all in the name of fun and love. But some people just didn't understand. You always did, Kurt, and I want to thank you for that. You never best. judged me. I did my best. I did. Thank you. Does anyone have a question for Kennedy? Raise your hand real high. Yes. Uh, libertarian the... Oh, Hi, Jim. Hi. How are you, Kennedy? Good. I used to read Le uh, Reason Magazine while watching you on MTV. So that's how's that? Great. For a that's like chocolate and peanut butter. Uh -huh. Who yeah. knew it was so delicious? <laughs> it's so not a sexual thing, is it? Yeah. Well, okay. My yeah. question is. Um, it is now. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, libertarians are often their own worst enemies when trying to communicate their philosophy and positions to non libertarians. So, what advice or suggestions do you, do you have on how we could do that better? Um, Beyond fellating microphones, <laughs> something, something gentler, perhaps. <laughs> do the opposite of what Nick Gillespie does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm the just absent kidding. Nick Gillespie. No, actually, uh, watch watch what Nick Gillespie does with Rachel Maddow on Bill Maher and do that every day because that was probably one of the most satisfying media moments I've ever witnessed. And uh, and sometimes I just, I, I have it DVR'd, sometimes I just rewind it to that moment where Rachel Maddow gets so mad at Nick who's, who's using, he's actually very restrained and is using common sense, which is the enemy of uh, emotionalism and and she just looks at me she's like you don't know me <laughs> and that was a that was a major victory so just just keep preaching the common sense that's all you have to do like you don't you don't need conspiracy theories you don't need uh, wild observations you can just literally point out simple flaws and offer uh, an even better consistent solution i think it's sort of an uphill battle because i don't think libertarianism is the default philosophical position for many people so I think most people don't thing. have a philosophical position <laughs> that and that's the problem I think exactly. most people when they discuss politics become so emotional and that has become so accepted right, right. that uh, the problem is when you try and insert some logic so we're stuck with the culture screaming at each other just... you're stuck with Chris Christie <clears throat> and you have to use words like undisciplined when you talk about him <laughs> <laughs> any other questions yes um, so, Matt so, Raskin from Bloomberg News. <laughs> no, 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 I'm speaking ex officio or unofficio. Um, so, what, I mean, I guess, so I'm younger than all you. I mean, I, I know that there was Ooh, this. Oh, fancy pants. Oh. <laughs> I knew that there was this. Go everyone tells me that there was, everyone tells me that there was a golden, like there is a golden age. And it was like that, the golden age of MTV. And they used to put videos on TV, which I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> Which I didn't know until recently, and you know, like uh, you know, co say the smart loves. things because right now you sound like a Kardashian. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so I, was, <laughs> it's I guess it's better than looking like a Kardashian. So I guess my question is, um, no, you, uh, you've got in, uh, your beard is not thick enough. No, <laughs> uh, my cranium's not thick enough either. But anyway, so my question is, uh, uh, what do you guys think about the the current crop of both celebrities? and the current crop of people covering them. So like, how does Amanda Bynes and, and Lindsay Lohan compare to, to like Courtney, Courtney Love? Love? Yeah. And then the people, how, how, who's, your, who's your counterpart today? And what do you think about her? I mean, Kurt has counterparts on MTV because there's still people who do MTV news. There are no more VJs. I mean, there, <clears throat> there really are not. I guess it would be people on the radio and I'm a radio morning music DJ, so I guess I'm my counterpart, and I'm a huge fan of mine. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's sad, it's a train wreck, but at the same time, it's also a gift, and I just keep wondering when Andy Dick and Amanda Bynes are gonna get married. 
Because those are some reality spawn that I want to follow for decades. <laughs> that sort of thing is eternal. I mean, there are always people like that. There's always Amanda Bynes. There's, you know, there's always the Biebers of the world. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, people like that sort of thing. Fine, why not? But it's always been with us. It's back to the 40s, I suppose, like oh, yeah. Screen Gems magazine or something. So I don't think there's anything new about that, and we shouldn't be upset about it. The culture is not coming to an end, but of course, everyone here knows that. So forget I said And Justin Bieber, by the way, has totally abandoned his monkey in Germany, and that is not a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, Kennedy. How are you? How are you? Very well. Hi, Jerry. Um, uh, what, uh, how optimistic or pessimistic are you on the future traction of libertarian ideas and what is the ideological trend of the MTV generation? That's a great question and um, something that, that I really love and another reason I wanted to write the book is because the people who were my age when I was on MTV, because I was you know, kind of part of the demographic having started so young, they're now having kids, they're paying taxes, they're involved in issues because they can't help it. And one of the reasons the 90s was so great is because it was prosperous and peaceful. And now our economy sucks and we're spending a lot of money still fighting wars, still funding entitlements, still destroying small business with Obamacare. And the more people see that firsthand, the more they realize that both parties absolutely suck balls and there has to be a better alternative. And that alternative is sitting right in front of them. And that is the consistent political philosophy that is libertarianism. And most people I know, whether they know it or not, are libertarians. You know, thank goodness I had Kurt Loder in my life to, to show me what that meant. And that's our job for other people. It's like, really? You want to have a handgun in your house and you support same-sex marriage? Libertarian. Boop. <laughs> Oh, I feel better about the world. See? That was brilliant. Is there anyone else? I think, I think that's, it. that's it. No more questions. We're, we're, we're done. Oh, okay. we're done. Thank you very much, everybody. Have another drink. Thank you very, very much. What's that? Oh. And I will be signing.